episode of Jay Leno's Garage. Now, this car looks familiar to you because you have a really good memory. When we started at Jay Leno's Garage, what, 12, maybe 13 years ago? Uh, this is one of the first cars we did. At that time, we had one little kind of handheld camera, and the videos were like two or three minutes long. So we thought we'd bring it back again. It's one of my more unusual cars, but one of my favorites. It is a 1958 Saab. It has three cylinders, it's 750 cc's, it's a two-stroke engine, which means it has no valves or camshafts or anything like that. You have to mix the gas with the oil, you know, that whole deal. Original was a three-speed, we put a four-speed transmission in it, also from a Saab on the car. And it's just a lot of fun to drive, it's front-wheel drive. Saab's, of course, made in, in uh, Sweden and unique, truly a unique automobile. They were designed by airplane engineers, by jet engineers, designed by jets is what they used to say. Uh, very aerodynamic, just wonderful and unusual cars to drive. What first got me interested in these was I had a friend of mine in high school named Fred. His mom had one of these. We used to take it out and just bomb around in it. And it had something called freewheeling. Now, if you don't know what that is, is when you engage freewheeling, that means when you get off the gas, the engine disengages from the transmission and you just roll along. And it was such an odd feeling, especially being so aerodynamic, to go down the street, take your foot off the gas, and to keep going at the same speed. You know, you usually have engine braking that slows you down. But this, you just kind of went along. And the engine makes all kinds of popping noises and weird sounds because it's a two-stroke, just like uh, a leaf blower or a lawnmower. And those engines aren't much bigger than this one. But it's a full four-seater. There was a guy named Eric Carlson who used to win all kinds of rallies in these. They used to race them on ice and put spikes in the tires. He beat everybody with these little underpowered sobs. In fact, I found a comic book. I think I bought this comic book when I was 12 or 13, and it showed a Corvette racing a sob, and the, the sob was beating the Corvette, and the Corvette was going around the corner on ice with the wheel off the ground. How you get the wheel off the ground on ice, I don't know, but well, here. I, I loved it so much, I had a painting made of that comic book. See, it's not really possible to lift a wheel when you're on ice, but that's okay. That's okay. It's a comic book. Anyway, I just always loved these. Fred and I would go out and just bomb around, and you know, you just put your foot to the floor. And with 750 cc, certainly not the fastest thing around. You might beat Volkswagens, but it was pretty close. But just a lot of fun. The gear shift is on the column. Saabs, of course, were one of the first cars to use seat belts. And these were driven mostly by, at least when I was a kid, college professors and people who wore earth shoes and even people who smoked marijuana, they drove Saab. There was a certain sort of intellectualism about them especially in New England. And you go to Vermont, there were tons of these in Vermont because they were good in the snow. And every English literature professor in a Vermont college drove one of these. They smoked a pipe and you know, the whole day. I mean, there was just something interesting about them. And when Saab finally went under, what was it, in 2011, I, I was sad to see them go. They really were a different kind of car company. And I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Very unusual, well, let's look under the hood. Let me open this up. Plus, you have suicide doors, as you can see. Okay, first off, the obvious. When was the last time you saw the engine in front of the radiator? The fan looks like something came off a desk from the office. It looks like an office desk fan. Little tiny three-cylinder engine, very funny. When you wanted these to heat up, you had the shutter inside. If you come around here, can you see that shutter right there? You pull the shutter, and that shade would come up and block off the radiator, and that would allow the engine to heat up quicker. They gave you an extra quart of oil to carry in here to mix with your gasoline, because this was a pre-mix engine. By that, it was about a ratio of 50 to 1. You put gas, a uh, little oil in with the gasoline like a two-stroke engine. Later motorcycle cars did it automatically. You know, they had a little metering pump. But back in the old days, you had to sit and measure it out. And if it smoked too much, you put in too much oil. Put in too little oil, <clears throat> the engine ceases up. But that's another story. Radiators right here. To me, the most unusual feature of this car, well, let me go around the other side. 
The generator is also the water pump. From here forward, it's the generator. From the back of the generator, it runs the water pump. Imagine the British trying to combine water and electricity in one unit. <laughs> well, I just don't think they could do it. But these Swedes are very clever people. And it works fine. It's never leaked. It's hilarious. It's very funny. As you can see, pretty straightforward under here. This is your catch tank. This is your radiator here. This is your heater. Uh, it's all very simple. Not much else to tell you. Battery is right there. Here's your fuse panel. Everything is easily accessible. Here's your coil. The heaters are unbelievable in these things because it's Sweden and it gets cold. And they're pretty bulletproof cars. Uh, there's your twin horns right up here. They made a Monte Carlo model, which was the 850. That was, ooh, the big racing model. The horsepower is about, I don't know, 33 horsepower, something like that. Not the fastest thing out there, but they get the job done. And being a two-stroke, you get on the freeway and you just put it in high gear and put your foot on the pedal and just keep it to the floor. That was your, uh, that was sort of your cruise control, just the weight of your foot. And you couldn't over rev it. The thing was just run as fast as it could and it'd stay there, which is about 75 miles an hour. You might get 80 out of it on a good day. Pretty bulletproof, pretty cool cars. Come on, let's take a look at the inside. As you can see, you've got a suicide door. I got this car from a friend of mine named Tom Donnie. Uh, he's a big Saab guy. You know, that's what I love about the car hobby. There's always one guy who knows more about the most obscure models than anybody else. And he found this one for me about, God, 15 years ago. Saab across from the first car to have seat belts. Everything else is pretty straightforward. These were kind of a thinking man's economy car. They're really unusual, really interesting automobiles to drive, as you'll find out in just a minute when you hear it run. They make the oddest noise. Nice solid door. Of course, your gas cap is right here. And you have a fairly good sized trunk. And of course, you got your two stroke oil right here. You got to carry it because not many places carry two stroke oil anymore. I'm sorry, no place carries two stroke oil anymore. So you got to find it. And I got all the original books, which is kind of cool. I haven't looked at these in a while. There you go, there's your Saab 93. It's I'm not sure how you say that. But uh, everything you need to know. That's what I love about these old manuals. They tell you everything. Okay, when was the last time you had a car that told you how to take the carburetor apart, okay? Most just have a big sign, see your dealer. And the nice thing is, it's in Swedish. But since they never break, you don't really need that. What is this? It's my license plate. Still got the Swedish plate on it. A few extra spare parts, but that's about it. Really, they're, they're, it, it is pretty bulletproof. I had this thing a long time, and it's very dependable, and it runs great. You know, my friend Tom drove his out from Iowa to visit me. And he was driving along the road, you know, da, 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 and he ran out of oil or gas, something, and the engine seized. He pulled off the side of the road, opened the trunk, took out an extra engine he had in the trunk, stuck it in. He was back on the road in under two hours. So, uh, how many cars can you carry a spare engine in the back in case you break down and just stick the other one in? You, see, you can't. Those days are gone forever. That's what makes you bond with the automobile. Come on, let's take this thing for a ride. I believe Saab pioneered these kind of seat belts, the over-the-shoulder belt. There you go. Yeah, Sven, we're ready to go driving. And see, so you hand wind this clock to start it. This way you don't kill the battery and drain it. Just wind it up. It'll last eight days. Pull out your choke, turn your ignition on, and you pull your starting handle. Put the choke in and continue motoring. a fun car to drive.
when I was a kid in New England, when it snowed, you take these out in the woods, you just bow through the trees with it, you know, it's small enough, you know, bounce off a few stumps. Plus, the speedometer registered in kilometers, so it seemed like you're going a lot faster. You know, your friends go, whoa, you're hitting 100. That's right, I am hitting 100. It's kilometers, that's like 62.5 miles an hour. But that's all right. My friends are idiots. They didn't know anything. The four-stroke sub came in and eh, lost kind of its luster for me. The charm was this two-stroke engine, just with the odd sounds it made and the smell. It was just so unusual and so different. Nothing sounded like it. And as with a muffler, you should hear without a muffler. Oh my God, it sounds like BBs in a tin can being rattled. Just the goofiest sound, isn't it? a small town like it and you had one of these, you had to be very careful. Because all the, the tough guys in town, the guys that had the Camaros and the GTOs and the Mustangs, if you took this into McDonald's, you went into the, into the restaurant to get something to eat, you come back, your car would be upside down, you know, like four or five guys would tip it upside down. Ooh, that'd be joking. You know? But you know, the funny thing is most cars, if the gas sits in the tank for six months or a year, it goes bad, you can't even drive it. My TR3, I didn't drive that for a long time, and God, it would barely go over 30 miles an hour. It's popping and banging because the gas had turned to shellac. With a two-stroke, when you mix the oil with the gas, this gas has probably been in there for a couple of years. I haven't had this out in quite a while, and it runs fine. All cars nowadays are so much the same, and this is so unlike any other car. As I said before, this was originally a three-speed car. All we did was add a four-speed transmission to it, which reversed the pattern. But uh, it is, uh, other than that, completely stock. As I said, 33 horsepower, something like that. Not a whole lot, but it doesn't weigh a whole lot. And it goes pretty good. really a big advantage to going to two-stroke. It just two-stroke engines were cheap to make, uh, easy to work on, didn't require a whole lot of maintenance, really. No valves to adjust, no oil to change. You know, you just had to pre-mix. You had to mix the gas with the oil. But that wasn't that big a problem. In fact, service stations in Europe sold pre-mix. They had, like, regular, premium, diesel, and pre-mix because there were so many two-strokes around. And then later, what happened was most of the Japanese two-strokes and, and the subs as well, they put in their own metering device. So you'd fill one tank with oil, the other tank with gas, and it would meter it automatically. So you didn't have to sit there and try to figure out how much oil to put in. Because if you put in too much oil, then it would smoke and that would cause a problem. They got rid of two-strokes because ultimately they pollute a lot more than a four-stroke engine. They're not as precise. These cars were great in cold weather. They made a lot of heat. Two strokes are pretty loosely set up, so they ran better in cold weather. You weren't as likely to, um, you know, the oil sticking up and you couldn't crank it or any of that kind of thing. Because there wasn't any oil. There was just the oil in the gas. It just makes such an unusual noise. And the freewheeling, still makes me smile, like I just took my foot off the gas and I'm coasting at just about the same speed I was going before because between the aerodynamics and the fact that there's no compression braking, you save fuel. Saabs were first introduced in America, I think about 1956. This is a 1958 model, so this is right at the very beginning. And believe me, next to a 58 Cadillac or Buick, <laughs> this is a weird looking car. People go, what? And they weren't cheap. You know, foreign cars were less expensive than a lot of American cars, but I think you got a lot more for your money with an American car. But extremely well made, extremely durable. You'll always say, how do you find a car like this? Whatever car you're looking for, there's a club. And in that club, there's a guy. And that guy has got more knowledge about where all the weird stuff is than anybody else. And that's the best way to find a car. If you're looking for 57 Cadillac, you join the Cadillac Club. And there'll always be somebody either retiring or somebody passed away or they're tired of it or whatever it might be. And you're going to get a car that's been maintained. You might pay a little more, 
But when you buy a car from a guy that's in a club, it's obviously loved the car and he spent a lot of time and effort getting his to be at, at least as good as he could afford it to be. So rather than go to a used car lot or buy it off a of Craigslist, you know, whatever car you're interested in, look that up on, you know, on the internet, obviously. Uh, find out who's the president of the club. Anybody, you know, mo mo most of them always have cars for sale. Join the club if you have to. And uh, that's what I do. I'm in so many clubs. You don't want to know what my dues bill is. This one was, looks brand new. It's restored to almost 100 points. And I think I paid about $8,000 for it, something like that. But it's dead reliable. I've never had it to do a thing to it. And I got it through a sob guy, a guy in a club, because he wanted to find me the best one he could. And, and I really appreciated that. All right, see, this is proof. You don't have to have a McLaren or a Ferrari to have fun. Uh, this thing, as I said, just makes me smile. They're, they're just terrific. And you can still find them pretty reasonably priced. I mean, they're getting up there, especially if you get the Monte Carlo. That's the big 850cc model. A lot of guys can't handle that one. That's got uh, something like 40 horsepower. So, yeah. But that's okay. You want to start out with something simple. But as you can see, it's a lot of fun to drive. It's different. It attracts attention. People love it. It smells funny. Ah, environmentalists will chase you. It's fantastic. See you guys next week.